Okay, quick, uh, quick recap. You know how I like to do that? The recaps come closer and closer. But in chapter 13, we saw last week, Ezekiel prophesies against false prophets and prophetesses. Those who falsely were saying that all is well, rather than sounding the alarm of God's coming judgment on Jerusalem. They're simply saying, peace, peace, everything's cool, you don't have to worry about anything. So instead of helping the people avoid destruction, they were luring them into believing that there was no danger and thus no need to change. And that's a tremendous disservice to people. I know people like it. You know, they like it when you tell them everything's okay, but when everything's not okay, it is unloving to say that and it is a forsaking of one's responsibility before God, and that's what they were doing. In chapter 14, verses 1 through 11, Ezekiel makes clear that the idolater's false comfort will be, taken, will be taken from him. And God says that the idolaters who seek false security and the prophets who give it to them, they'll be punished. And in the last half of chapter 14, he dispels one of the lies on which the, uh, the prophets built their prophecies of peace, the presence of a righteous few within Jerusalem will not save it. Apparently they were saying, don't worry about anything. You know, we've got some righteous people here. That'll be adequate to save it. Uh, and he dispels that notion. In chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, or the whole chapter, the point is that Jerusalem is God's vine that is about to be burned. Remember he talks about the vine and what good is it? So if it's partly charred, all you can do is just go ahead and burn the rest of it. And so all of this, I told you before that you'll get weary with this. As God through all, you know, especially the first 24 chapters, he is saying over and over and over again, you are wicked, you are evil, you have treated my kindness horribly, and you'll be sitting here going, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. But God has beat this drum for a reason. He is the one who inspired this to say again with different pictures, different ways, he is trying to stress this and he's trying to emphasize it because we as people do not like to face squarely our evil. We have a tremendous capacity, a tremendous capacity not to see ourselves as we are. And so he wants to sit here and he just again, and he wants no mistake about it. As I say, you'll get weary and we'll cover some more of this as you'll see it'll continue. In, in, chapter, in chapter 16... This is an allegory that serves to emphasize Jerusalem's unfaithfulness. Now, God was very good toward her. He blessed her. He showed Jerusalem tremendous kindness. And Jerusalem repaid God with tremendous evil. And anybody can understand that. When you are very good and kind toward someone, and they return your good for evil, it's a terrible thing. And this is what he says about, about Jerusalem. And for that reason, Jerusalem's going to be punished. But even in the midst of recounting the evil that justifies the punishment that he's about to inflict on Jerusalem, God reveals that he will remember his commitment to the Jewish people and he will establish with them a new and everlasting covenant. Now this is an important thing. I mentioned this last week. This is an important note. And throughout these, these chapters where God is emphasizing the wickedness of Judah and how Judah deserves what he is about to bring on her. He sprinkles in these notes of hope. And here you see one where God says, listen, even though all he said, if you and I were God, what would we say? I'd have been saying, I'm kicking you to the door, and you're through. That's it. But God tells them that he will remember his commitment to the Jewish people and establish a new covenant. God continues to love Israel despite the fact that she doesn't deserve it. Okay, now this says something very important about our God. And I'll say more about that as, this, as the theme of redemption takes center stage later on in the book. But it's important, and, and God will say it in some of what we look at today. He tells them about judgment, then he'll give a note of hope. Judgment, wicked, judgment, coming, coming, note of hope. Okay, then, then as the book moves, you'll see that redemption takes center stage. As God is going to bring the people back in something that, you know, it's a second exodus where he's going to bring the people back from exile. And people be going, when does this happen? A nation has been treated like this. God says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring them back. And historically, that's exactly what he did. 
exactly what he did. All right, in chapter 17, it, it, it speaks of a, a king, it's a, a riddle that speaks of King Zedekiah's rebellion against the Lord and the failed diplomacy that he exercised between the two exiles of 598-597 and the coming exile of 587-586. He, he, he gives that riddle. And in verses 22 through 24, they speak of God's intention to install one of David's descendants as the Messiah, as the ideal ruler of Israel. And so here we have a messianic note that is sounded in 17, 22 through 24. Chapter 18 declares the principle of individual responsibility, and that's where I want to pick back up. I was talking about that last week. I'll say a little, you know, repeat myself just a little bit, and then we'll go on from there. But uh, being this deep into the book, it might be a good time for me to remind you of the comments of that 19th century Puritan scholar, William Greenhill. He characterized the book of Ezekiel as full of majesty, obscurity, and difficulty, okay? So you remember the first class, I, I mentioned that, and I said, what I hope for is that I can at least you know, get, convey enough of its majesty, remove enough of its obscurity, and lessen enough of its difficulties to at least make it worth your time to be here. See, that's one of the things I seek to do as a teacher. I don't like wasting people's time. You know, I, when you come here, I hope that you come, and when you, when you finish with the class, you'll say, I was glad to be here. I learned something. And that's the goal. That's what I seek to do. I hate it when I sit here and say, you know, uh, so that's, it's a low goal, but I hope at least I can achieve that. But I you will not walk out saying, I have no more questions about Ezekiel. You know, I've been to the Oracle of Delphi here, and everything's been answered. You won't have that. Okay? But I, I'll just, I'm pitching at it. And I'm giving it, uh, giving it my best shot. Okay. Now the hardships in chapter 18, this principle of individual responsibility, he stresses, because the hardships that are coming on Judah, they were being rationalized by this proverb where he said, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now what they were doing, they're saying, listen, we're getting punished, but we're not really evil. We are simply receiving the fallout from the iniquity of the prior generations. And see, what that does is that then eliminates the need for introspection and repentance. I don't look at myself and say, I am in need of change. I'm in need of changing. I say, no, I'm just getting fallout. I'm not being punished for wickedness. Not at all. And see, so he says, I'm going to put an end to this proverb. And he tells them that punishment comes on those who deserve it. And he wants them to see that they are in need of repentance. They can't keep you know, fooling themselves this way and thinking that they're not in need, need of repentance. And he, he mentions this idea that you know, a man who does what, what is right, thereby indicating he's a man of genuine faith, that he will live, meaning he won't be condemned. Then he says if he has a wicked son, well, he will be condemned. And then that son has somebody who's righteous, well, he won't be condemned. So we got the righteous man, son, grandson. And each one switches and they'll be judged and treated according to how they act. And I ended making the point that that teaches us that the environment is not omnipotent. And that's a very important point, in my opinion, in our culture. See, the son of the righteous can turn wicked and the son of the wicked can turn righteous. That can happen. You can't just sit here and say, listen, because somebody's wicked, that means that there's some flaw. They were taught that way by their parents or something. Now, I understand that family life and things can have can bend us and twist us, but we are ultimately responsible. We are not automatons. We're not robots. We have choice to make, and we can choose to follow God despite the fact our father was wicked, was an alcoholic, was an abuser, and by the same token, we can have righteous parents, and we can choose to rebel against them and to go off into evil. Okay, then he also says here that a person can, and, and by analogy, a nation can change his status from wicked to righteous and vice versa. He says the wicked who repent, they will live. So here's a person who himself is, is wicked. He says the person who's wicked, he can repent and live. Their prior rebellion will not be remembered. And on the other hand, the righteous who turn to iniquity will be condemned. Their prior righteous deeds will be forgotten. So here's somebody who's righteous, living, struggling, living, and then decides to turn and go into evil. He says that this person can wind up going into death despite their prior righteous life if they turn from God. 
And by the same token, the person who's living in evil, if he will repent and turn to God, he goes into life. And this tells us that habit is not omnipotent. Environment is not omnipotent. And habit is not omnipotent because people can choose to turn to God despite having lived evil lives. And aren't you thankful? See, aren't you thankful that you can turn to God despite having lived evil lives? I don't care what you've been in. I don't care how long you've been in it. You pick the ugliest, dirtiest, filthiest thing that you can imagine, and you've lived in that. You've lived in it a long time. There is no sin that is beyond the mercy of God. No sin that is beyond the mercy of God. If you will turn to him, if you will repent, he will not remember your wickedness, he will not hold that against you, and you will be right with him. You live, you live for God a long time. You decide, I'm through with this. I'm through with it. I don't like living this way. It's too daily. It's 24-7. I don't like always having to think, how should I be? What should I do? I just want to go out and live like the rest of the people. You turn from God and you go into evil and you will be lost. But this idea, see, that, that you can... You can choose to turn to God despite having lived evil lives to me is a wonderful thing. And it's interesting here that if you see in, in, in this chapter, in 1825, you see that some people will object to that as being unfair. They'll object to it as being unfair because it's not a balance sheet accounting. Say, so wait a minute. A guy lives all his life. He, he lives, you know, 90% of his life and then he rebels for 10. How does it make any sense? That's not fair. Or the guy's wicked, you know, all the time. Then he comes to you in the last, you know, the proverbial deathbed. Can, what is that? So there will be people who will say this is not fair. But God declares it would be unfair to accept rebels and condemn the penitent. He's interested in present hearts, not past lives. Present hearts, not past lives. And I just think this to me, it, it is, for me, it is a wonderful source of comfort and I love it that I don't sit here and look. And, you know, I think about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor... He's writing to the church in Corinth. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers nor male prostitutes nor homosexual offenders nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. That is what you were. The door is open. I don't care what you've been in. The door is open. But you need to turn to God. You need to repent. Whatever you've been in. The door is open, but don't fool yourself and continue to live that way and think God will bless it. He will not. He will not. But the door is open, but you must turn. And that's what he says in Ezekiel. He says the wicked, okay, they need to turn. And if they will turn, they will live. And that's just the greatest news. Present hearts, not past lives. And I think that's just a tremendous, uh, a, a tremendous thing. So the judgment God brings on Israel, it'll be according to, its way, according to its ways. He desires, his desire is that they repent and they avoid national death. He has no pleasure in the death of anyone. Okay, he has no pleasure in the death of, death of anyone. In chapter 18, verse 30. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you. Each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord, Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. I take no pleasure. You know, God is caricatured in our culture. Because he is a righteous God and calls people to repentance and he will judge the impenitent. So how's he care? He's caricatured in our, in our culture as though he's just this mean God, hates people, trying to kill them. He takes, the pleasure, he takes pleasure in the death of no one. No one. But he will not be played for a chump. Okay? He calls people to bow, to come, to surrender. 
whatever you've done, whatever you've been in, but you got to come. Got to come, see? Can't fool yourself, can't lie about it, can't hang on to it. You're deceiving yourself. So this is how God he tells them. In chapter 19, he speaks of lamentable leadership. Ezekiel, he delivers these stories in what's in a standard lament cadence. And in verses 1 through 9, he tells of the rise and exile of two Judean kings, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. They're the two lions who arise from the lioness Judah. And if you remember Jehoahaz, he was disobedient to the Lord and was exiled to Egypt after only three months of his ruling in 609 B.C. And Jehoiakim, who's also reigned only a few months in 598, 597, he was taken into exile in Babylonia. So he speaks about here this leadership, and then in verses 10 through 14, he speaks of the uprooting, the coming uprooting of the nation that will most immediately be triggered by Zedekiah's rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, Zedekiah is the puppet king who's been installed there. He's going to get bold after some years, and then he's going to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, and that's going to bring Nebuchadnezzar in 587. He's going to come and bring him, and that's going to be the immediate trigger of the disaster. Jerusalem will be left with no one fit to be a king, and so any confidence that they have in Zedekiah, you have people who are saying, listen, no, 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 you know, these, these voices of saying God is coming in judgment on Jerusalem, They've been there for a long, long time. Never happens, never happens. God will protect Jerusalem. So you have people saying, look, Zedekiah will get us out of this. Zedekiah. So he says, uh-uh. No trust in Zedekiah is going to be rewarded. Zedekiah is going out. Okay, in chapter 20. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 32. Here you have the elders coming to Ezekiel to inquire of the Lord. And this to me, is, this strikes me. They're coming to inquire the Lord, and they want to be able to engage in idolatrous worship like the other nations. You can see that in verse 32. This is what they want. They want God to put his imprimatur on their idol worship. And so they come to inquiring of Ezekiel, and God won't permit them to inquire of him. Instead, he tells Ezekiel to rebuke them. Now, it's not mentioned here whether, whether he cut them off. As you remember, some weeks ago, we looked in chapter 14, or last week, chapter 14, verse 8, where he said he would deal with them themselves and cut them off. It's not mentioned whether he did that, but it's possible that those who are coming to Ezekiel now are in a different category than those in chapter 14. It's possible that those in chapter 14 were not only those who harbored idolatry in their heart, but that they were also secret practitioners of idolatry. So even if he doesn't cut them off here, it's possible they're two different situations. But Ezekiel rebukes them in chapter 20 by rehearsing Israel's dismal love affair with idols. Okay, he continues to expose Israel. Look at who you are. Be honest with yourself. Look at who you are and how you have treated me. And so here they're coming. They want to, they want to engage in idolatrous worship like the other nations around. And then Ezekiel rehearses for them. Look at, look at Israel's history with idols. And he goes through and he says, they didn't forsake their idols when, when God promised to bring them out of Egypt. In verses 7 and 8. Now the Old Testament doesn't elsewhere record that Israelites were commanded to forsake Egypt's idols while still in Egypt. But it's certainly clear that they had adopted Egypt's worship practices. You can see them, the warnings against idolatry and that kind of thing. In Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 32, Joshua 24, 14. But rather than destroy them in Egypt for their rebellion, which God could do, right? I mean, wouldn't God be right and justified in destroying them? But rather than do that, he brought them out to keep his name from being profaned among the nations. He did it. For his glory, he brought them out. He didn't want their bondage to be misconstrued as somehow God was inadequate. He was unable so he brings them out rather than have his name profaned among the nations. And after the exodus and the establishment of his covenant at Mount Sinai, the people rebelled against God's laws because their hearts were devoted to their idols. He says in verse 16, because their hearts were devoted to their idols. They're rebelling against God's law. See, this was the fountainhead of disobedience. And the reason is, is that it relativized the supremacy of God. If I have other gods I'm worshiping, then he's just one among many. Rather than being the God, the only God. And so it, it fueled their disobedience because it relativized his supremacy. 
And this is something that God won't have. God could rightfully have destroyed them all, but he decided out of pity and for the sake of his name that he'd prevent the first generation from entering the promised land. Well, Ezekiel goes on, the second generation also rebelled, which included setting their eyes on the ancestors' idols. You can see that in verse 24. You can see their rebellion in Numbers chapter 25 with Baal of Peor. You and I sit here and go, what is up? But see, there are lessons here about the long road of life and being faithful to God in the long road of life. You see, you live and live and live and you start to think, well, you know, God is kind of distant. God is ancient history. God is this, God is that. And to keep the immediacy of God, the reality of God, so that it affects how we live, takes effort. Otherwise, you can kind of go into this slumber, say, you know, God's not that important. God, I don't really care. And find yourself being off. And you see it with the people of Israel again and again and again. And here you see them here engaging in this idolatry that they'd practice. He brought them into the land and then he gave them the opportunity. He tells them, though, he could have destroyed, he could have destroyed them there again, but he chose not to do it for his name's sake. He did, however, swear to them in the wilderness that after bringing them into the land, he would scatter them among the nations in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 25 through 28. They're going to come in and he knows what they're going to do. And he says they're going to be scattered. He brought them into the land and then gave them the opportunity to fill up their cup of the cup of sin in the form of the immoral ordinances or the immoral laws and the immoral practices that were brought to them by the pagans. And so that's, why, that's exactly what happened. Then he says in verses 28 and 29, in Canaan they just went idol crazy. They're worshiping idols everywhere. And I just think about, you know, God, who he is and how patient he is with us and how tolerant he is with us, and aren't we glad? Because you just look at this, and I'm telling you, you know, if I were God, we'd be in trouble. Be in trouble. But he, he, God shames them then by asking him if they will go on defiling themselves in the manner of their ancestors. And then he flat tells them that he won't be consulted by such people. And in verses 30 to 32, he will never relent to this idea or accede to this request of idolatrous worship. Never. That's never going to happen. Okay? It's never going to be okay to be worshiping idols. And he makes that clear to them. And then we get another note here. In chapter 20, verses 33 through 44, we get another one of these notes of hope. After all that has been said, all that he's talked about, he says here, by his power, he's going to free the captives from bondage and lead them through the wilderness back to Canaan. You have clear Exodus imagery here. Just like he led them out of Egypt, he's going to bring them back, this time from Babylonian captivity. He's going to lead them through the desert, through the wilderness, back to Canaan. And those who return will be those of true faith, those who've been affected enough by their chastisement, those who have been broken by what God has done, by the extreme punishment and discipline he has brought on them in the destruction of Judah and the complete leveling of Jerusalem. Those who have been affected enough by that chastisement to endure the pain of relocation and the hardship of building a nation, these are broken people who come back and get it because it is not easy to relocate and it is not easy to build a nation from scratch and you know what happens when they come back. You know, remember they started building the temple and the people are sitting there going, man, this is a, this is a dog compared to what we had. And there's all kinds of resistance to them and, and fighting and politics and all this kind of... It's not easy. But the people who are led back are those who are willing to endure that because they have been chastised and they come back as people of faith. And that's Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and all those people who are led back. And so God brings them back. And in verse 39 and 40, I read that, they're, that they're a call to choose that if they won't listen to God, then go and serve idols from now on because God is weary of their idolatry. And he has a right to be. <laughs> you know, I get people criticizing God and sitting in judgment of God as we have in our culture all the time. Just people sitting here and God is this and God is, a, he's a child abuser for sending Jesus Christ and all this kind of stuff. And it just is, you know, I just sit here and think, you know, what is he putting up with? These creatures. You know, in, in his hand is life and breath and everything else. He gives us all of this. And we're sitting there, who is he? Yeah, yeah. 
You know, it's just, and yet he, he bears with us. And I see these people sitting and say, well, if God is real, strike me down dead. Yeah, you see people do that. You know, they, they say horrible things about God and then they try to make a point and say, well, if he's real, strike me down dead. I'm thinking, you know, you ought to be thankful that God is who he is. And he understands how little you are. And he understands what you don't know and don't understand. You know, that you're like a little infant saying, strike me down. And God says, you're too stupid. You see, you don't get it. Because he could strike him down like that. And he ought to praise God that he doesn't. Okay, he's going to reestablish the nation of Israel. And on Mount Zion, they're going to worship him properly, not idolatrously. And the mercy of God's restoration is going to profoundly humble them. And then in chapter 20, verses 45 through chapter 21, verse 7. Here we have Ezekiel, he preaches against the forest of the south, declaring that, that God will totally consume it by fire. And the audience he's preaching to, they apparently thought that, listen, this is too obscure, that he's, he's not making enough sense because he says, all, all sovereign Lord, you know, they say I speak to them in parables. And so they're, you know, they're apparently they were complaining that what he's saying in verse 49, that it's not clear enough, so God then supplements the revelation to make the allegory he's just given plain. And the, what he's talking about is the Babylonians are going to attack Judah from north to south. Okay, the Fertile Crescent, see, from north to south, going to attack from that way, come in down this way. The Babylonians are going to attack Judah from north to south following the roads of the Fertile Crescent. And throughout the entire land from north to south, the righteous and the wicked will be killed and exiled. So he's telling this is this is what he's talking about. And then Ezekiel is to groan and sigh. See, remember, he, he, he symbolizes things. He acts things out. He's to groan and sigh. And when the people ask what he's doing, he's to tell them that they will groan in this fashion when the terrible news of Jerusalem's destruction arrives. And I think we have a difficult time understanding how invested in Jerusalem the people were. This was their capital. This was their homeland. This was their city. And they're, they're thinking that this is going to be protected. And when the word finally comes that it is a fact, a fait accompli, Jerusalem has been sacked and destroyed. This is a killer. This is a killer. So it's going to be you know, that they're going to sit here and they're going, they're going to have a difficult time and a terrible news. Then you have in 21, 8 through 32, there are three oracles that are grouped along with verses 1 through 7 of chapter 21. They're grouped together because they all involve a sword. Okay, in verses 8 through 17, they speak of God's sharp, polished sword. And they make clear that warfare is coming on, Jeru on Jerusalem, on Judah, and it's going to result in widespread bloodshed for the nation. There's no way of softening this stuff. This is what God is bringing on them. In verses 18 through 27, Ezekiel depicts a road going from Babylon to Canaan, and there's a marked fork in the road. Okay, there's this marked fork in the road. One leads to Jerusalem, and the other one leads to Rabbah, which is the Ammonite capital. And then he, has, he, he portrays here, he's got, uh, he symbolizes the king of Babylon deciding at this fork in the road which city to attack first. He was going to attack Rabbah because the Ammonites participated in the rebellion against the Babylonians. But which one's he going to do first? And he has him engaging in these common forms of divination. He's casting lots, he's consulting idols, he's reading livers. Okay, this is how people would try to discern what is the will of the God? So he has this king of Babylon sitting here at the crossroads deciding, and he chooses that he's going to attack Jerusalem. It's selected. And then verse 24 again makes clear that this is judgment for Israel's constant and severe sins against the Lord. Now the people of Israel had to hear this because you can see how devastating it would be for your God to allow your nation that was his throne... His, you know, he had his temple there to be destroyed. And you could see how it would be, well, maybe God's not omnipotent. Maybe God's just one of these lesser deities who got thumped by Marduk. And so God wants them to recognize that, no, this is me at work. This is me bringing judgment. I'm not getting trumped by anybody. And they had to hear this because this news is going to hit like a ton of bricks because they're harboring this idea, being fed by false prophets, that this isn't really going to happen. But the news is going to come, and they're going to hear it. 
and it's going to hit them very, very hard. Verses 25 through 27 indicate that Zedekiah is going to be stripped of his kingship, and the status quo in Jerusalem will be turned upside down, and the city is going to be reduced to rubble. The kingship, uh, the kingship that's removed in this invasion will be restored only when Israel's rightful king is given the crown by God himself. Okay, it's going to be restored only, the kingship will be restored only when the rightful king comes who's given the crown by God himself. And this king who's further portrayed in chapter 37 and following is the D Davidic Messiah. He's not just another Judean monarch. Okay, this is the Davidic Messiah. And it is, of course, Jesus, king of Israel, king of the Jews, king of kings. Okay, he sits on David's throne. Jesus Christ will be the next anointed king. Now, Jerusalem the bloody, chapter 22, verses 1 through 31. I told you, he just goes on and on. But chapter 22, verses 1 through 31, you get in verses 1 through 16, it's a catalog of the city's sins for which God is going to disperse them. These include shedding innocent blood, okay, killing people. Or rigging the system so that people are executed who shouldn't be executed. The shedding of innocent blood. Idolatry. The abuse of power by leaders. Dishonoring parents. Oppression of aliens. Mistreatment of the fatherless and the widow. And a variety of cultic, religious, and sexual sins. So he goes through and he, he just lists these things and discusses these things. He says in verse 12, they forgot the Lord, which means that they rejected him. And he now will reject them. They chose. They rejected him. And he now will reject them. Verses 17 through 22, Ezekiel employs this metaphorical language of a, of a metal refining furnace to indicate the destruction coming on them in Jerusalem, coming on the people there, because they've become like worthless metals. He says they're going to be treated like metal. They'll be gathered in Jerusalem, the furnace, and be melted by the Babylonians' withering siege. They're going to be locked up in this city, which is what happened. You remember I told you, the ancient warfare, you've got walls all around, so people, what do they do? When they're under attack, they close up. And then when the attack lasts and lasts and lasts, and you eat all the food that's there, and you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And so he's got them pictured here that they're going to be melted by the Babylonian siege. God's people, see, cannot cling to false hopes. This happens. The false prophets were feeding it. And they have to see the truth of what's coming because that's the path of hope. Now Judah is destined for cursing, he says, which he symbolizes with a drought on the day of its judgment in verse 24. And its leaders... Its leaders are guilty of helping it along this path. And then he goes and he, he tackles each of the groups of leaders. And he exposes their role in this. Okay, he tells them, he says, the kings in verse 25, they've devoured the people in their quest for wealth. Now this is probably a, a reference to excessive taxes. See, the kings, they, they would, you know, I mean, this is the way governments are. Their appetite for your money is insatiable. Okay, now, I won't launch off on politics, although I could. But this is just how it is because I always can do stuff with other people's money. And this is what the kings, they have excessive taxes. And what they'd wind up doing when somebody wasn't able to pay them, they would foreclose. And they would put the, the husband of the household, the, the head of the household, into debtor's prison. And when he died, he'd then leave the wives widows. And when you see what he describes these kings are doing in verse 25, that fits what they're doing. So he says, this is what you're doing. This is evil. You kings who are sitting here and just, you know, driving people into debtor's prison where they're dying and creating widows. Then he says in verse 26, the priests have failed to teach the people what the law required. And thus have failed to keep the nation cultically, religiously, and ethically pure. See, they have to teach people. You have to tell them. You have to say this is what God requires. This is what God demands. We have to be taught. And there's a temptation not to do that. There's a temptation to get off onto other things. That's what the priests had done. And you see God here clearly blaming them. Verse 27, the government officials have become corrupt. 
They're seeking to make money for themselves rather than to administer justice. Okay? They were interested in making money. They had lost their sense of the nobility of justice. And this is an evil before God. Verse 28, the reputed prophets have covered up such sins with false prophecies rather than condemning what's going on. That is the role of a prophet. Certainly part of the prophet's role is to call a spade a spade and sin, sin. And when it's there, it has to be called out. And they'd been intimidated or whatever it was, and they masked it. They covered it when they should have been shouting. You need to stop this. The Almighty God calls on you to stop this. Repent. Repent. But you see, people don't like that. Nobody likes that. If you come and preach about sin and calling people to repent, and I'll tell you, you'll get the boot. Just depends. But you get on certain things. You want to talk about the evil in the society of abortion, the evil of divorce. You talk about those things, and people say, I don't want that. I don't want to hear about those things. We've killed 43 million kids in this country since Roe versus Wade. 43 million. And what do we do? They say, well, that's political. I don't want to get involved. I don't, you know. Okay? We are called to be a prophetic voice. And there are a lot of things that you say these things, and you can't talk that way. He speaks in verse 29, the prominent landowners, that they've acted like the kings and officials. They've used their power to help themselves at the expense of the poor and needy. Then God says in verse 30 that he searched for somebody to fortify the city, somebody to stand in the way of his destroying the city. He searched for it, and he found none. Now, this is hyperbole, because Jeremiah is there. But it makes the point, see, that it means that the righteous are so few that the net effect on the city was, was if, as if no one cared about God's will, and he's coming in judgment. Okay, he's coming in judgment. About the application of these kinds of things to the United States of America. Okay, now my view of it is, I look and I say, we get to 25 through 32, God is the God of all nations. Now, I think, see here, God is here speaking of the elect, the chosen, and how they had acted and that kind of thing. But he is the God of all nations. And he judges those nations around who, who rejected him by rejecting Israel. And I look at this country and I say, as our country turns more and more godless, more and more godless, can we expect to be blessed by God? Brother John, I, what's the year? Is it Life magazine with the abortion thing on it? 1962? Saturday Evening Post. Is it 1962? He's got a poster that he uses in some of, the, some of his teaching. 1962, it says on there, Saturday Evening Post on the cover, was it the great social evil of abortion? The widespread social evil of abortion. That's in 1962. We're here now. But you, you just go through these things. You go through that. You go through sexual perversion that is being mainstreamed in our society and on and on, okay? And you look and say, well, will God withdraw the blessing he has given to this nation? How long can we just sit here and say about God, listen, I'm going to be anti-God. I'm going to attack Christians. What will happen? Is it any wonder? So, you know, when things happen around here, you know, I know people like with 9-11, they say, listen, this is a, this is a wake-up call. This is God, and people mock them. But I don't know, people. I do know, I'm convinced, that as a nation says to God, drop dead. Okay? Even nations who are pagan nations around Israel, as they show their hostility to God by how they treat Israel, well, as we as a people who've been blessed, founded and rooted in a Christian faith, and then we then turn around and say, all that God says, we're just going to say is nonsense. I think he's got a point. <laughs> See, and his point is, is that People in the church need to be aware of this, and they need to see it, okay? And I think there's something to that. Now, I probably didn't do that justice, but I want you to know that I took your uh, exhortation to heart. Okay, I, I'm not going to have time. Surveys taken today say that not even 50% of the people in the United States believe in God. But you can just look around. I mean, older people can see this. Young people, you know, think that the world started yesterday, but older people can look and see that there has been a tremendous a tremendous moral decay in the last 50 years, okay, where things that you look at and you say would never have occurred are now blessed 
And those who object to them and say that's wrong are even to the point, for instance, in Canada, who will say and preach against homosexual conduct, they'll throw you in jail for hate speech. This is hate speech. So, you know, I don't know what's in store. The Lord knows. And here, they've tried that. Okay, thank you for coming.